Welcome, uh, welcome in once again. This is Ballpark Digest podcast, our regular chat. And when we talk regular, this is special. Curious George hung out with the man with the yellow hat. We're about to hang out with the man in the yellow tuxedo. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, joined by Kevin Reichard, the publisher, the editor, the writer of Ballpark Digest. And as we hand out the awards, Kevin, for the 2021 season, it is time to name an Editor's Choice Award. Yeah, we launched our uh, our uh, award season, which always gets a lot of attention. And uh, by the time you you see this, you'll 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 know that uh, Editor's Choice, one of the Editor's Choice awards for this year, uh, is going to uh, Jesse and Savannah Bananas. So welcome, Jesse. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Excited to be with you. The great Jesse Cole, who's got his banana ball rules right behind him. Let me start off with this. It's 2021. 2020 challenged everyone in similar ways and in very different personal ways. How was this 2021 season for you getting to open things up back up to full capacity? Uh, it was amazing. You know, for our team during 2020, we vowed we weren't going to let anyone go. Everyone's going to have the same salary. We're going to find a way to create fans. And we go into 2021 and it was just gangbusters. You know, we had to turn away 50,000 people that had bought tickets in 2020. The season was sold out and we had to tell them, hey, we're back. And even though we were told by the state to be limited in the beginning, once we got back, it was amazing. And we had fans come in from every single state this year, over 20 countries. Uh, we've never seen anything like it. So very fortunate to open up again. So why don't you explain a little bit for the for the few people in the industry that don't know about you or know you, uh, how you, how you run Savannah because it's it's basically two two businesses in a way, isn't it? Yes, and 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 long story short, so I, I learned ten years uh, with the team in Gastonia that's no longer in the Gastonia Grizzlies, and my wife and I we took a crazy venture and came to Savannah, Georgia after they had professional baseball for ninety years. We came in as college summer baseball in the Coastal Plain League, had all these lofty goals and vision to make the whole ballpark all inclusive, every ticket, have break dancing coaches, pep bands, banana babies, everything. Um, but that vision didn't really come to fruition right away. We sold only two tickets in our first three months. And uh, by January of 2016, we overdrafted our account and uh, we were out of money. And my wife and I had to sell our, our house. So uh, it was a bad, bad, you know, shape we were in. But what we did was we, we said we got to create attention, name the team the Bananas, came up with the Banana Nanas Senior Citizen Dance Team, came up with the Man Nanas, the male cheerleading team, made it into a full entire cast of production. And fortunately, you know, six years later, every single game is sold out. Uh, the waiting list just hit 12,000 for tickets. 2022 is already sold out. And uh, so we reached a crazy capacity uh, challenge that we had in Savannah. So instead of just adding seats and we said, well, could we take the show all over the country? Could we test things and, and uh, play a different game that's even more fun, more uh, uh, fast paced and more entertaining? And so we tested it in 2021 and we developed the one city world tour instead of just go all over the, all over the world. We did one city. We named, went out to our fans. Where should we play? We got uh, 3000 suggestions the first year and uh, ended up going to Mobile, Alabama, sold 7,000 tickets in 24 hours, two amazing nights that I'll never forget. And now that has pushed us to take it even further and we're going to continue expanding. So we got our pro team of professional guys playing banana ball. And then we got our collegiate summer team uh, that ended up winning the championship again this past year that plays by the regular rules. And uh, yeah, that's what we have. Yeah, you know, I, I would imagine running running two different businesses like that is, is real challenging. And and you're being a little modest. You led all of uh, summer collegiate baseball in attendance uh, at home this year. And uh, you made national headlines with Banana Ball. So uh, the, the, from our end, the award sort of a, a no-brainer. Um, and, and yet I feel you got bigger things coming up. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, we have a very big vision. You know, I look here in my office and I got custom posters of Walt Disney and P.T. Barnum. I've read every book of them and uh, we have a big vision. And I think what we're seeing is that we're doing something a little different. And because of that, you know, we know baseball is challenged. You know, it's a great game, but it's getting longer every year. Uh, you know, viewership's going down. Tenants went down again this year. I think uh, there's an opportunity to hit a younger fan base. And to do that, you need to make it a faster, more entertaining and more exciting game. And so, yes, we were fortunate. ESPN came down, CBS Sports, uh, Boston Globe, uh, USA Today ran a story. There was a bunch because our players introduced themselves coming up to the bat. You know, now batting for the bananas, myself. You know, we had golf batters. We had players introduced with pep bands. You know, we, we can break all the rules of the traditional baseball game to make it fun. And fortunately, the CPL allows us to do this. And obviously our pro team, there's really no red tape. So I think the future of, of baseball is, 
is how are you going to hit that young audience and how are you going to make it a faster, more exciting game? And so we are going to take what we're doing all over and continue to learn every day and experiment every day. And uh, that's exciting. Yeah, I, I think that's something the industry is really grappling with right now. I was just at a, a, an owner's a group of owners meet uh, an owner's owners meetings. And uh, the big issue there was uh, how do we attract a younger demographic? And uh, they, they didn't really have many clues. Um, I threw them a few few ideas, but you know, I I I, I think it's going to be a slower change than people realize. So I'm happy to see you pushing it along. Quite honestly. Well, thank you. And I, th I think you have an opportunity if you're able to, you know, continue to experiment every day. So like our, our TikTok, for instance, just a year and a half ago during COVID, we said, we're just going to post things every day about making baseball fun. We're not going to show doubles, home runs, strikeouts. We're just going to show the guys having fun, dancing, doing things on the field they've never done before and test it. Now we have over 900,000 followers, 250,000 more for that. 250,000 more followers than any major league baseball team. And I think what's happened is you're seeing a young audience wants to see things that are different. So how can major league baseball, let the players celebrate more, let the players have more fun, let the players do things that aren't conventional. And then you'll see more fans say, Oh, this isn't your grandpa's game anymore. It's a little different. Well, and that's for the, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to, to ask you about the lessons learned in terms of this, when you take as many risks and you take as many chances as you do, not everything's going to work. So what lessons have you learned from what you've tried that hasn't worked? Sure, it's a great question. And I, I think we have a goal every single game, we do four new live promotions we've never done in front of a live audience ever. So four brand new ones. So for instance, if we have 50 games, you're talking about 200 brand new experiments. So out of those, maybe only 20 will work very well. But that's 20 that will add to the show that'll be ep epic and legendary. So the lessons that we've learned um, again, the main concept we look at is whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. That is the framework for everything we do. So when you look at a, a normal pregame, and I've been to AAA ballparks that are the best in the business, AA ballparks, are the best in the business, and I get there and I keep track of how many times do I either need to go to my phone or am I bored or is there no music? And if you look at 99% of minor league teams from the gates opening until first pitch or national anthem, there is music playing. We have 55 promotions in our pregame. So literally we open our gates with, because there's, we're fortunate now there's a line and people line up a few hours before the gates open. We have a full march where the band comes out, our entire team comes out, our player on stilts comes out, our princess Potassia comes out, our male cheerleaders come out, our banana nanas come out. Before we open the gates, we do a whole performance and a whole dance with the crowd. And then we fire it up and open up and people run to their, and then from there, we have a stage, a promotion set up for our plaza, our grandstand, our concourse, our field, and our parking lot. We have five stages. Now, to answer your question about the lessons, we didn't do any of that five or six years ago, but we've become fanatical about those boring moments. Like, now, this is the visiting lineup. This is the home lineup. We have weigh-ins where it's like WWF, UFC, and they literally come in. We weigh off, and then they end up doing a tug of war. Could be a dance off. I mean, it's, and then that goes right into our parade, which we have a parade go through the entire concourse. It is outrageous it is extremely difficult extremely hard but i don't ever want to be bored and i don't think any fans want to be bored and so the lessons are keep trying keep testing we had a halftime show in a baseball game last year you should never have a halftime show we actually had our players run off the field we had a countdown in the middle of the game no one knew what was happening they ran off the field and we had a, a savannah pipe and drum band because it was our saint patrick's day night and they were all in their 60s and 70s and they didn't get to rehearse at the stadium so when we announced our halftime show they slowly walked out it was the most anticlimactic entrance of a halftime show. And they didn't face the crowd. They faced themselves playing in a circle. And everyone's like, what is going on? And they played for four minutes and everyone's delayed. And I'm in the duck dagger pacing back and forth wondering, oh no, oh no, no, no. But people said it was so memorable. So now when you always take risks, people forgive us for making those mistakes and making those things that don't work. And so I think it's just constantly challenge ourselves to do the things, keep coming to bat and keep swinging. My dad said as a kid, Jesse, when I went up to plate, swing hard in case you hit it. And every day we are swinging hard. And a lot of times we miss, but when we hit it, it makes pretty good contact. Like we saw what happened on ESPN and all the national publicity. You know, when, when you talk about trying something, see if it works, see if it doesn't. That's one thing that's lacking in baseball quite a bit. And I think sports is, is if you come from marketing, A-B testing is like a staple. Everything. And yet you never see that in baseball whatsoever. They stick to their script from day one to game 161. Because 162. 
and, and I have respect for all the operators and the teams that are listening to this. 80 games, 70 games. I have a lot of respect. We're fortunate that we, we have, you know, three home games a week and we can adjust from there. But yeah, I mean, we don't even talk about theme nights. We, I mean, theme nights are something you put all your effort into one night and it's done kind of halfway. You know, if a few people dress up, a few people not dress up. Every night is our opportunity to be a bananas experience. And so every night we want a Tuesday night to be as valuable as a Saturday night, as a Wednesday, as a Thursday night. Make your overall show better and test things in your overall show so you don't need to rely on fireworks or Marvel night or Star Wars night or whatever that is. And I think that's what we've learned over the years. Theme nights are too much work for too little return. Well, every one of your games and events. Yes. Not, not just certain ones in the calendar. There you go. And, and, and again, I think that's why football and soccer kind of have an advantage because the, those sports treat everything like an event night now it's go. not it's not oh it's a it's a wednesday night game let's just go through the motions and get the heck out of here as soon as we can yeah. um, and, and every game is someone's first game we yeah. tell our team that before every and no one on the bananas team gets a uniform until they go through fans first you and our bananas orientation and we tell all the stories they have to they literally for me they can't get a uniform until they go through an hour two hour orientation on what the fan experience looks like and then we lay out the vision. And before every game, we share how many people from different states are here. 24 states, 32 states. We put from six countries. So they realize it's not just a baseball game. There's people traveling hundreds of miles to come see this event. Not you hit a double to see the show you're going to put on. And when you share that over and over again, they understand what matters most. And then they happen to win, which is really cool as well. <laughs> well, it doesn't that that doesn't hurt either. But yes. um, how, how do you manage the pro part of it in terms of payments and things like that? I'm curious sure. is, is how that's set up. Sure. Again, experiment. I mean, again, small bet, small bet, small bet. So, you know, we only played four games last year. So obviously it wasn't a huge expense to us this year. We're going for two months. And so we vow to pay more than every minor league team does. And so, you know, so we, we, we start with a, what's the best case scenario and then work backwards guys. When we first came up with the idea of making the entire ballpark all inclusive, the idea said, we're going to make every ticket include all your burgers, hot dogs, chicken sandwiches, soda, water, popcorn, dessert. We had no idea what we should charge. We never did it before. We had no idea how it works. So we said, $15 sounds great. And we tested it. And fortunately, the numbers worked, even though the first game, people had to wait for three hours to eat. It was a disaster. Um, same thing, we look, what's the perfect scenario? And then work backwards to figure it out. So we're like, all right, you know, how can we pay our players you know, 2,500 a month, 3,000, whatever it is, and make it work really well, and then go from there. So yeah, they're all paid. Um, obviously, we help with housing, food and bev. We travel to hotels every weekend. They stay, we take care of, we have celebrations. Um, but it's not the money. See, I, I think like it's these guys, I mean, we were traveling to Kansas City to look at a potential city to go to and Bill Leroy's with us and Kyle Lewis. And four times they got stopped and said, oh, are you Bill Leroy? And they're like, oh my God, we watch you on TikTok. Thank you so much. We love the videos you guys do. I mean, they feel like they're making an impact. And so when these guys are a part of something, our player on stilts, he became a celebrity. He was interviewed by all the news. Like you could pay me to do that. Like, are you kidding me? So I, I think it's, how do you make them feel like they're a part of something that they're not just a cog to the system, that they're a part of something bigger than baseball. And then you have to pay them and take care of them really well. And then it's a win-win and that's what we're trying to do. So that one mentioned, go ahead. No, you go, you, we're, we're fighting over you, Jesse. So go ahead. <laughs> No, just the whole idea that in minor league baseball, here's the way that things have always been done. And major league baseball, here's the way that things have always been done. But something that's always happened in minor league baseball is there's a lot of stealing and the whole imitation is the highest form of flattery. So what have you seen? What have you done that you have seen already that it's influencing? It's made those waves out there in whatever form it might take in another city. Sure. And, and, I, and it's a good question, but I think there's two ways of looking at life. You can have abundance mindset or scarcity mindset. And we have an abundance. You know, if, if for some reason in 10 years, Major League Baseball takes one of these crazy rules and actually does it, awesome. All right, run to it. Keep batters in the batter's box, for God's sake. That's one you should take right now, but that's a whole other story. Um, yes, certain teams, um, you know, I've got some of our pro guys, you know, we had our first pro team, 14 of them signed pro contracts. And I got texts from two of them. Oh my goodness, this one team, Jesse, they're doing all their same promotions. And obviously we share everything. We stream everything. We have everything. We don't have commercials. We don't have ads and they see it. And he's like, man, that, that's so, I'm like, that's good. Hey, how are the fans reacting? Oh, they like it. Well, good. That's good for, them. you know, I don't, we don't need credit for what we do. We are all learning things from other people. I mean, I go on cruises, we go to circus shows, we go to Vegas solely to watch shows so that we can bring them into our show. 
So it's the exact same thing. If you take it from us or learn something from us, it's a win-win. So yes, uh, teams have taken our banana baby that we do before the game and we lift the baby up and have all the players. And I'm like, that's a banana baby. How do, all right, that's fine. Teams have used that. Um, but you know, again, it honestly really doesn't bother me. And, and you know, being also very open, no one puts the time into ideas that I and our, our team does, nobody. And I mean, literally, while teams are working on sales calls, we're spending a couple hours a day working on ideas and way do you see the things people thought we did crazy things last season, this season, it's like times 10. And then I'm going to push myself the next year to go times 10 again. And so uh, do whatever you need to do, but we're going to, we're going to be working pretty hard to keep our ideas fresh. So one quick, quick follow-up yeah. uh, about the, about the new ideas that you're pushing, Jesse, baseball yes. fans by nature are a nostalgic sort because human beings by nature are nostalgic and sentimental. Have you had people come to you and say, Boy, I, I wish you did that thing back in 2017. I wish you did that thing back in 2019 again. I really love that. When are you going to do that again? Oh, uh, you know, it's <laughs> yes, you have some fans. I mean, when you do so many new promotions, and again, our list now is over 400. So 400 on field promotions. When you think about that, that's a lot of promotions. And some kind of like front end. You know who I've learned a lot from um, is the Grateful Dead. I'm not a big Grateful Dead fan, but they are one of the most fascinating bands as far as what they did in their business. And, you know, the marketing lessons from Grateful Dead, everything I learned in business from Grateful Dead, two amazing books that I think everyone in sports should read. And they talk about how every night they would play completely different songs. If they did three city, like three nights, they would play a completely different song every single night. And that was part of the, the lure. People want to say, what are they going to play? What are they going to do? What's the excitement? Dave Matthews Band has obviously taken a book from a uh, page out of their book and they're doing it now. So every night I want people to come to all our tour events because you never know what the bananas are going to do. Now, will we play a few of our favorites? Getting 4,000 people at the stadium doing Hey Baby. Yes. Our players doing a dance every night. Yes, but every night they do a different dance they've never done before. So it's all part of the, the show that we try to create. So, uh, yeah, I, I, know, I know we've done some promotions in the Bay that like Living Pinata, where like we put like an intern in a, tur in a turtle costume, had kids like hit them with bats, soft bats, like the plastic bats, and threw candy. Fans wanted that one. We've done cold turkey where we actually brought real turkeys out, and fans had to see who, how, who could get the turkey as warm as possible by jumping on it, putting it on their belly. Disgusting, broke all health codes there was. We don't do that anymore. Uh, the horse head race, we put kids in horse heads and had them race, but they got lost. One went up the outfield, one went up near the pitcher's mound, one went in the wall. Fans loved it because it was a disaster. They love the promotions that don't work. They want us to always do that. For me, it's like painful. I'm like, guys, I don't want to do that again. That was painful. But uh, yeah, we, we hear from fans regularly on uh, bringing back some of the uh, promotions in the past. So now this next next world tour is what the five city world tour or is it? it uh, it's actually seven. So seven now? we have one more announcing on Tuesday uh, or, or that have already been announced. So yeah, well, it'll be seven cities, six cities where it's bananas versus party animals, our other team, which is another whole circus in itself. And then one challenger, we have Kansas City Monarchs, the independent team, say they want to challenge us and play us. So they're, they're helping co help take care of us to get down to Kansas City. And we're going to play banana ball at their stadium. And the bananas are the home team, which is just awesome. So it'll it'll be your rules, their ballpark. Yes. For fans. Yeah. Be well, it'll be our fans. It'll, it'll be our I mean, it'll be fans. Your fans. Your, it'll be your fans. It'll be bananas fans coming in, yes. and or, or going out, either one. Yes, yes, yes. So... Um, the the other thing that that I was I, I'm sort of fascinated by you know you've got your Odyssey you've got the 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 yellow the yellow tux explain that a little bit when when you first first decided to become the guy in the yellow tux. <laughs> so again, when I first started in our first team in Gastonia, two hundred sixty eight dollars was in the bank account that first day. We had three full time employees. Payroll was on Friday. Uh, the team had only two hundred fans coming to the game and lost one hundred fifty thousand dollars the previous year. That was my first day on the job at 23. So I read every book I could and I kept coming to PT Barnum and I just kept reading about his ability. I was like, we got to create attention. We got to put on an act. We got to put on a show. And I just kept reading and reading it. And after like two seasons, you know, I was doing the whole show. I was pieing fans. I was doing everything in the field. And I was dressed up like every minor league operator, a polo and pants, you know, and, and doing my thing. I was like, I'm putting on a show, but I'm dressed like an average player. I was like, I can't, that's not, that's not who I am. So I channeled PT Barnum and uh, I got my buddy to get me, who worked at a brought a formal shop, he got me a black, black tuxedo with tails and a black top hat, but it was 101 degrees that first game. And I almost melted in that black tuxedo. I said, this is not going to work. And so I went online and found a yellow tuxedo, brightcoloredtuxedos.com, bought it overnight it for the next game, wore it. Fans kept taking pictures. They're like, oh, we love it, love it. And it became my uniform. And more than anything, my first book, Find Your Yellow Tux, you know, it's, it's about standing out and finding what makes you different. And for me, this is my uniform. If I put this on, it's showtime. 
when I'm with my kids and family, this is off. I'm just a dad, but I'm here. I'm in full, you know, PT Barnum, Barnum mode. And, uh, and then also more than anything I share, it gives our team permission to have fun. If your owner is running around, I mean, we throw out Dolce and banana underwear in the crowd. Yes, we have our own custom underwear. We've sold thousands of pairs, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. But I throw that in the crowd. I'm taking selfies in the crowd. I'm doing jokes in the crowd. If I can do that in a yellow tuxedo, our entire team can have the permission to have fun. And so it's part of, you know, our whole mindset. We're different than everyone else. And, and we have to try to own it. So how, how big will the world tour be, say, in, in two years? I, I, and I find it fascinating you're, you're sort of bringing back barnstorming at a time where we're living on video. <laughs> and not only not only we talked about this before, but bringing back barnstorming when there's really no baseball team doing it anymore. You know, you have the Globe Trotters oh, yeah. who travel with – the Globe Trotters I've become close with. They travel with 32 people. We travel with 92. We bring the entire pep band. We bring the male cheerleaders. In. We're doing something completely unscalable, <laughs> completely unscalable. But that's what makes it special if you make it special enough. So um, I said publicly uh, just the other day, um, the goal, you know, I was a kid. I was bat boy for the Red Sox when I was five years old. I got to pitch at Fenway when I was 20 in an all-star game. I said, in five years, we're going to sell out Fenway Park with the bananas and banana ball. And I'm saying it publicly and I'm telling everybody. And it's amazing. Since I've started sharing that, people have been reaching out like crazy. People from, well, we're going to make this happen. So um, I see within five years, you know, being able to sell, sell 30, 40,000 venues. Um, but I would say we'll go from seven to 15 to 25 to 40 um, and eventually doing 100 cities. I, I see us playing in front of more fans per year than the Dallas Cowboys or any NFL team playing in front of a million fans a year. And uh, I'm 100 uh, percent confident that's going to happen. Well, that's a lofty goal, but I, I, we think I, big. So did Walt and so did PT. Ex exactly, exactly. And, and you know, I, I find it interesting you bring up PT Barnum. Because on the one hand, if, if people don't know much about him, they just think, you know, suckers and all that stuff. He never said that. He never I said know, that. I, I know. I just read the, the, most, the most recent biography of him. Uh, it was fascinating. Yes. He was a great American. I mean, exaggerated stuff and showman. But, but you know. But he had the interest of, I mean, my favorite quote from him is that the, the noblest art is that of making others happy. Like yes. he genuinely wanted to make people happy. Yes, he exaggerated things. Yes, he had crazy things in his museum. He wanted to bring joy to people and he would find any way to do it. And that's so, yes, I'm glad that you, a lot of people think of him as this kind of person, just you know, promoter, you know, mess with people. And ugh, yeah, that's not him. Oh, the opposite. I think, I think you're exactly right. He wanted to entertain people. He, he wanted to earn their money by entertaining them. And yes, that's earn, the, earn was earn. the key. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I, I hope his reputation gets a, a little more cleaned up. Um, yeah. because the biography was great so so i yeah, well the movie the movie helped too and everyone came to me after yeah. the movie the greatest show me they're like oh was that was that true i was like of course not but it's exactly how pt barnum would have done it he would have created this great over-the-top musical and entertained everyone oh People yeah are still singing those songs it's exactly how he would have done it so i was a big fan of the movie i thought they did a great job it, exactly my daughters loved it they never asked me if it was true life <laughs> or not and i would have said not even close <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, we talked about the past, we talked about the present, we talked about the future. Um, again, uh, to just to, to stress about the, the award season, you know, this, this is, despite COVID, this is going to be a really great award season. And, and, and I'm really honored to be able to recognize you and the bananas and your, your wife who, who uh, I'm friends with on Facebook. So I, I know how hard she works and you work and the family is and uh you know it's really sweet well thank you thank you yeah she's she's the heart she's the one planning everything and we put one percent of our top line to surprise our our team with special trips special things with their family special things and everything. so she's always planning that and you know it's amazing we talk about covid and we talk about everything and i think talking about team members we're so fortunate, you know, we've hired 10 more full-time team members in the last few months. We're hiring another three. I mean, we're going to have over 30 full-time team members for, for a little team that started as a college summer team. We're very proud of that and uh, taking care of them. As a guy, Emily started working for a minor league team making 19,000. I was a GM making 27,000. I'm so glad that we're paying everyone dramatically more than that. That starts with us. And it just makes me feel proud of what we're able to do. Any thoughts of, of expanding to a, to a larger uh, area, larger city for a full-time base, or is, is Savannah going to be the, the heart of the operation? 
Savannah will be the home of Banana Land. So I, we didn't share about that future vision, but we're building Banana Land, which hopefully will be the most fun ballpark in the world. So an entire theme park, very inspired by Disney, um, that you will see things at a stadium no one's ever seen before. And that's going to be the destination. Savannah has 14 million tourists come there a year right now. It's a beautiful city. It's a wonderful city. It's our city. We're going to make that our home and uh, we'll grow out with the tour from there. Excellent. Uh, Jesse, if you don't mind, um, can you get more into the rules of banana ball? Because there they are right behind you. There are the eight rules. And I was wondering if you could talk us through them and annotate them with any comments that you would like to add in. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll go quickly. Uh, so uh, the biggest concept, how everything from banana ball started with the idea of eliminating friction of a baseball game experience, eliminating the, the boring parts of baseball and adding the fun parts, the best parts overemphasizing them, the worst parts eliminating. That's the whole mindset of how we do everything in our ballpark for our fan experience. We want to do it with the game. So three years ago, we started testing and we said, all right, can we make the game faster? So we said, could we have a two hour time limit? That was the first one. Let's just see. Can we do it? And then the second one was fascinating because we realized that a baseball game can get very boring if a team scores six runs in the first inning and the game kind of gets out of hand and it's really out. We said, well, what if we make every inning count? What if we made every inning matter? And then what's the best part of baseball? The most exciting play is the walk-off. The ninth inning, two guys on, base hit, celebrating. What if every inning could have a walk-off? So that's how every inning counts it was developed. So visiting team doesn't score in the first inning. The, first, the home team comes up, base hit, base hit, base hit. Inning over, celebration. And our team does Gatorade showers in the first inning. I mean, they will jump up into the crowd, like do like the leap. I mean, they act like they just won the World Series, which is so fun to see in the first inning of a game or the second inning of a game. It pumps the energy up to another level. So that's how that was created. Uh, next, batter stepping out. I was watching a game four years ago and Yasiel Puig was up. And I actually had a timer. And the, it was anywhere between 35 and 49 seconds in between pitches. And I was like, oh my goodness. And he had a good at bat. It was like eight pitches. I was like, are you kidding me? This was a, a 10 pitch. Like that was an issue. And I, I was a big fan from Boston. Nomar Garcia Parra. Yes, I love the things he did with the, the, the batting gloves. It was fun, but get in the batter's box. And so we just started testing that for batters. If you step out, it's a strike. Um, mound visits, we don't need them. They're, they're used to delay the game. If you see a pitcher's in trouble, get your pitcher warming up earlier. You know, it's part of the game. Um, Walks. This is the this is my most fun one coming up with because the reality is think about an athletic sporting event that you have something in the game called a walk. So it's like in the middle, it's like, all right, now it's time to walk to the base. The most uneventful, boring moment you could have in sports. So I said, what would be the opposite of that? What's the opposite of a walk? A sprint. So now we developed a sprint. So again, on that fourth ball, as soon as it is, the umpire, fourth ball, the umpire goes sprint. The batter takes off full speed. The catcher has to throw the ball to every player in the field before it's live. So you're watching this hitter take off full speed. You're watching the ball go around the horn. The outfielders come in and you have at least a double, maybe a play at third. The first time they didn't know how to do it, it was a home run. It was very funny to watch. The game opened with a home run walk, sprint. It was ridiculous. Um, no bunting. This that really the run in the home run. What's that? That puts the run into home run. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. This next one, purist hate, uh, no bunting. Uh, I say, and I usually follow it up with bunting sucks. That really upsets a lot of people. But this goes back to my dad as a kid saying, "Jesse, swing hard in case you hit it." I want people coming up to bat swinging. I want bat flips. I want celebrations. Again, all right, we're just going to tap the ball. We're going to give it a little tap right now. Swing the bat, have some fun. So I know baseball purists don't like that one. Um, what else do we got up here? Uh, batters can steal first. Yes, that's a. Uh, we thought uh, that's just a fun one. Um, again, penalize balls. Penalize pitchers that throw balls, throw balls away, get the game going faster. And then uh, finally, uh, yeah, uh, two last ones. If fans catch a foul ball, it's an out. That is, we always reimagine what the best possible scenario in a game can happen. And I, I kept reimagining this. I kept thinking, all right, base is loaded, end of the game, the bananas on the mound. It's a 2-1 game, two outs, guys rallying. They have foul ball. A fan makes a catch to end the game. And all of a sudden, the players rush up into the grandstand, are lifting the fan up, celebrating. The media is interviewing the fan. The game's over. I'm like, that's the most amazing play in the world. Uh, except it happened the exact opposite. That Our fan actually caught a ball from the bananas this past season. Uh, and literally, the whole stadium started booing them. <laughs> I brought a police officer over to almost escort him out of the field. Uh, it was ridiculous. We'll work on that. Turn uh, that poor person into Bartman. He almost became Bartman. I had to, you know, we took care of him. He goes, I was trying to protect myself. I go, don't catch it. <laughs> Stop to rally. Uh, and then finally, the last rule, um, I heard about Rube Waddell. And I don't know if that name stands out to either of you guys. Uh, 
crazy character. I mean, I learned about him pitching during times of Cy Young. Unbelievably talented, but the ultimate showman. I mean, he would he would have fun with the fans. He would drink with the fans. He'd eat with the fans. He'd come out, and he would often tell everyone on the field to get off the field so he could pitch one-on-one versus the hitter. I was like, that is the ultimate showmanship. Could we make that the extra innings? And so we tested it, and we had pitcher versus hitter, and the hitter has to score. And what we realized was the hitter, you know, choked up. He would try to put the ball in play. So it wasn't as many strikeouts as we hoped. So we added one fielder behind the mound. And now that's the showdown. If the two hour time limit hit and it's tied, it goes to a showdown pitcher versus hitter with one fielder. Whew, that's banana ball. In the history of the world, the Mel Brooks movie, you've got uh, Moses coming down with the 15 commandments and one tablet breaks the 10 commandments. Were there banana ball rules that you considered? And then in the end, that tablet broke. <laughs> I get asked that question a lot. Um, I, I don't think we, we got to any other crazy ones. We will. We will add some. I will tell you a new stat that we're adding that I think you guys might appreciate. So um, stats based on pitching, ERA and whip, two of the most important stats in pitching, ERA and whip. The new stat we're adding for 2022 is MPI. Can you guys guess what it stands for? You ready? It's a pitching stat, MPI, minutes per inning. We are gonna celebrate how fast pitchers can work. Can you be the world's fastest pitcher and throw three minute innings? And so when you're, you can celebrate that because that's what we want, very fast innings. So now we're going to have MPI. Greg Maddox would have dominated back in the 90s. We're going to get guys who can really work fast. And I think that's going to add to the excitement of the game. So how long did it take you to train the umpires in this whole scenario? Seems like they have the toughest job of all. Dramatically more because last year we had a dancing umpire who never umpired before. So <laughs> it took it took a real long time to teach him. But uh, no, we had one that, that started doing with us in 2020 uh, during our COVID season with a small amount of fans just testing it. So the biggest adjustment was batters stepping out. We had to teach that and other, but it's not, it's very similar. I mean, the rules are very similar. There's just a few added ones into it. And you got to watch foul balls a lot more clearly now. Right. Right. So. Still, that that's a challenging task. Yes, it so, is. Uh, well, congratulations again. This is, this is, I, I appreciate you because uh, the, you also sort of inspire some, some, some crankiness among older, older fans and older people in the baseball industry. And that's always a good thing to be totally honest. So uh, I, I tip my hat off to you for that. Well, thank you. If we get people talking and thinking about how to create a better game and a better experience, I think that's a win. Right. And that's, and, and sometimes that kind of gets lost in the whole shuffle is, is the fan side of the experience past just the stated, we want to shorten games. Um, and I, I also, I also, as the father of two younger girls, I, I appreciate the emphasis on TikTok. Uh, I, I told these owners to go close their Facebook accounts because they don't really need those people anymore. And, and I swear half of them had heart attacks because they're on Facebook 20 hours a day. And it's like, what the heck is this TikTok thing? But that, that's where the younger people are. The, the younger people are these days. So 100%, 100%. And you got to have young people operating. You know, we had, uh, I started with as an intern in college. She was operating. She's watching it. She's paying attention to it. You know, put, put young people that are in that world in charge of it. Don't put someone else, a marketing director. That's what we focus on. Put people in their experience that they know what they're doing. So it's been fun. Good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm done with questions. Uh, if you have any, Jesse, no, that's th This has been terrific. The man in the yellow tux, Jesse Cole and the Savannah bananas winner of the 2021 ballpark digest editor's choice award. Jesse, thank you very much for taking the time. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, Jesse. He's Kevin Reichardt. I'm Jesse Goldberg's Drassler and this is ballpark digest. <laughs>